Welcome back to the Whole Topic Podcast. Today, we will be discussing cultivating relationships with your children. This is, I have children, Stephanie has children, Ariel, who is not here with us today for this one, she has children. <clears throat> so it's always things that come up about how to build relationships, what are different things you can do in your home to make sure that you are building a good foundation for those relationships. And that's what our plan is to cover here today. Um, so if you're just here for the first time, we're super glad to have you. And we're just going to go ahead and jump right in here. So I think we probably should say first that um, we're not perfect parents. And if anyone tells you they are a perfect parent, they're lying. That um, <laughs> we have just learned things over the years, what's worked for each of our mm -hmm. families. And we, all three of us, I can even probably say for Ariel that we desire to have good relationships with our children and our family it matters a lot to us. And so this is just based off of experience as in all of our podcasts, take a piece of what works for you and your family and you can disregard the rest if yeah. it doesn't work for you. But yeah. these are things that have worked between our family and you'll see that between the two of us, we may have different suggestions as well. Yeah. And like she said, if something works that we share, then use it. If it doesn't work in your home, it doesn't work mm -hmm. for your family, then don't use it. Like that's the beauty of having your own family. You can cater it to mm -hmm. your needs and your family's desires. So Definitely. I just want to get started with, um, so I firmly believe in starting young, mm -hmm. like from the time they're like three years old, I will set aside a time every single day where I will do a tea time with my children. It usually when they're that age, it's about, I would say 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. However, as they get older and they always have that that date or that tea time to look forward to every single week, it builds up 45 minutes, sometimes an hour and a half. Sometimes we'll go to a store they want to go to together. And because I started so young, it has built a foundation of trust. And, and, and they always, always, always have a chance to sit down with me during the week and discuss things that maybe, you know, in the busyness of our life, we didn't get to actually catch with each individual. I have six kids, so it can be really hard to sit down and try to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, deep conversation, mm -hmm. if I don't make sure that I have time for it. So just to get like letting the cow out of the gate, if you will, like <laughs> make sure you know you have to set times up to spend with them. Now, if your kids are older, um, what is something how would you recommend starting that now? You know, if we've missed the mark of starting young. If you're dealing with older kids, I can tell you what I would do, but you would just have to try it. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a foundation of trust or you feel like, like just the other day I was um, on, I was watching a reel, I think on Instagram and the, the, the woman was really sad because her kids wouldn't talk to her. They were teenage kids and she just kind of recorded herself sitting there being ignored. And I thought about that and I, I'm not going to pretend to know how that women, woman like taught her kids or was with her kids. However, I do know this. If you have even accidentally ignored your child so much and focused so much on things that you wanted and you desired and you pushed, you might have to slowly create a foundation, if you will, for that age. Mm -hmm. Um, Find things that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Be interested in those. If they're interested in games outside, go play outside with them. If they're interested in art, sit down and, and get them a video and just start by being interested in who they are as a person. Yeah. If they're just hanging out, bring them a cup of tea and hang out and be like, hey, you know, here's a cup of tea. Yeah. It's the small acts of service. I feel like, especially with kids that are like, I don't know, teenagers. Mm -hmm. At first, if you have a really bad relationship, I'm really sorry about that because that has to be super hard, but it's the small acts of love without mm -hmm. uh, judgment. Yeah, judgment. Like you have mm -hmm. to do this with me. I'm your mom or your dad. Um, just starting out with slow acts of love and then building up like you would, yeah. like I did with my three-year-old, 15 minutes. And then at some point you might realize that they do want a relationship with you, mm -hmm. but you have to be willing to respect them. 
like you want them to respect you and build a relationship based off trust, not based off demands. Yeah, definitely. No, that is, that is exactly right. That, you know, meeting them right where they're at. So, you know, if it's a teenager that you're dealing with and um, not young children, like she, like Andrea said, start with, you know, 15 minutes a day, or maybe just invite them to go somewhere with you or do something that you know they will like and meet them right where they're at. Um, and just building it small and growing from there because it just, everything stems down to relationship. Yes. And for me, I don't, I don't get to meet every day with my kids. I know Stephanie doesn't get to like mm-hmm. do those one-on-ones every day. However, I do have a day dedicated to each kid. They at least get a 45 minute slot. Mm -hmm. I can find that in my day. (laughs) Um, Some of you might be working. Some of you guys might be, um, well, working or homeschooling or whatever it is you're doing in your day. It might be very busy. However, you only have a certain amount of time with your kids. And I promise you, it's going to be worth it. I always tell Mm -hmm. my husband, I'm like, I know when my kids leave my house, I might not be able to do the tea time with him. But you can, you know, bet your bananas. I will probably be sending them a text during that tea time and be like, "Hey, I miss you or thinking about you." Yeah, because it's such a, it's just a such habit. A part of your yeah. life. Yeah. Um, and then let's talk about. I think I want to talk about consequences now. Like, okay. I get this question, you know, more often than not, about how to deal with your kids with consequences. Um, let's start with you. What What would you do in your home? From let's maybe let's start with littles. Okay. How would you address littles when they're having problems or? So in previous episode, I don't remember how many episodes back it was. We talked about, I need time to myself. And usually um, I have done that since they were itty bitty. I mean, two years old, three years old. We, we kind of separate in the heat of the moment. It's, it's not something that any of us are prepared to deal rationally when something has happened. So the first thing that I always do is, say, let's take a time to ourselves, whether that's me, them, whatever. And my kids have always known, I've never been a big fan of timeouts. So we don't, we've never really done timeouts. Um, We've always called it time to yourself. And there's never any length of time that they need to take a time to themselves. So when I think of a timeout, I think of them having to go to their room or sit on a chair or sit in a couch or corner or whatever for a set amount of time. And I'm setting the timer and you can't get up until then. And I think in theory, it that's not uh, the person who ever created timeouts or the mom who uses a timeout. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just telling you what my experience is. I don't think they intended it to be, you know, something like that. I, I really feel like it was used as a means that they need a time to themselves too. The mom needs a time to themselves. And it doesn't necessarily mean that in five minutes, everything is all okay. It, it just means you need to take whatever length of time that is to regroup so you can handle it appropriately. And I'm not the best at it. And I know that sometimes when it's the heat of the moment, sometimes I am maybe raising my voice a little too much saying, take a time to yourself, <laughs> which is what I'm trying to avoid is screaming and yelling or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but that has been number one. And then typically once everyone has cooled down, we can just talk rationally. Um, and then after that, you can really talk about it. When they're super little, the real consequence for us isn't really um, a consequence in terms of like a punishment. It was more so of after we talked about it, we had to redo it. So I, the consequence was now we talked about it. We talked about what the right way to handle the situation was. Now we're going to go back and they think it's hilarious. When they were little, they used to laugh at me all the time. And I'm like, hey, so now we're going to do it all over again and you do it the right way. And we act out the whole scenario again and they have to respond the way that they should have responded yeah, the tra- first time. It's a training ground. It's-, it's a training. And it is just the more times you do it the correct way, then you're not having to correct it anymore because that's just how you do it. Yes. And so- um, And that- little, little kids like- they think it's funny. Opinion, yeah, they do. And they're not, <laughs> yes, they're little sinners. But some, I've seen some parents where they correct their child as if their child is purposely trying Try, to be yes. hateful for, to them. When in reality, you're their parent and you're mm-hmm. supposed to be guiding them when they make mistakes gently and kindly. And so I read a book. It's called The 14 Gospel Principles of Parenting by Paul David Tripp. And one of the things was, is he said a lot of times, 
the, and I've read this multiple times and I read it way when my kids were little. And one of the things he said was that a lot of times when your kids are acting up, we take it so personally that that's when we actually sin in our correction to them because we take it as a direct attack on us and the kids are not trying to directly attack us. They're not trying to hurt you or, I mean, maybe some are deliberately disobeying and that takes a different consequence because that's more of a heart issue than it is a behavioral issue. And so that's a different thing, but when they're super little, it's not a direct attack on you Mm -hmm. and we're human. So as a mom, we start feeling that way and then our consequences or our discipline or our correction follow suit to that. And And, and if we can get out of that, I've had to really, that's a really good point. Cause Micah and I've talked about that. Like when we correct our kids and of course, I don't know any parent that always corrects their kids 100% right all the time. Right. However, like Micah and I have taught my husband and I, Micah have talked about this, um, in our discipline, like when we correct our children, we shouldn't be correcting them as if they're offending us, but rather if you're a believer, they're offending right. the one who told them mm-hmm. to obey and to do what was right. And may like always keeping that in mind. I think that's such a good thing. And also in the heat of the moment, this is something you touched on about disciplining in the heat of the moment. And I think that is such a good, the consequences in the heat of the moment is that it's a terrible time to give consequences. Yeah. Let's just be real. Because a lot of times your consequence is going to be way above what blown out of proportion. It, yes, like <laughs> what the offense was. <laughs> exactly. So something I did. This is really funny. I still laugh about it, and we've, we've laughed about it together. But my my oldest son, um, when he was younger, we I would sit together with him when we were actually happy with each other, and because like there's not a lot of time where I'm upset with my kids. Like right. they're pretty good kids. I do feel as a mom, so but they're just pretty good kids. So I decided that I was going to sit down with them during one of their tea times. And we were going to lay out some different consequences that we felt fit certain situations that would happen more frequently than we liked. And so we did, we set them out. We were very calm about it. They got to contribute to it and be like, you know what? I feel like this is a fair. Sometimes the crazy thing was sometimes they would write consequences far worse than even what I would. I was like, <laughs> That, that doesn't deserve, I mean, that's not okay to do, but that, I would not give you that punishment. So we would change it and we'd, we'd come with a conclusion. Well, he would get to the point where there's this one habit he had, and I'm not going to say what it was, but it was one habit he had. And I remember watching him, I was sitting in the kitchen and I looked up and he did this habit and I looked at him and he looked at me and he was like, well, I better go get working on my consequences. And he had such a good attitude about it. Like it was just his response. He knew I wasn't upset. Yep. He knew when I gave that consequence, I wasn't going to be like, oh my gosh, you did that again. We just agreed that this was the consequence and he had to fulfill it. And to the point that when it happened, he just knew it became joyful. Like I'm going to do it. Mom's not mad at me, but I'm going to do it. So just making sure that when you come with consequences, get your children involved because we're doing this because we love them. Right. We're not doing it because we're trying to get even them or make them pay for something. It's just to remind them to do better next time. I mean, well, and I always tell my kids when I'm giving out a consequence or when we're talking afterwards, um, I always tell them, what kind of mom would I be if I didn't correct you when I see you going down the wrong path? Mm-hmm. And I always tell them that I'm like, when you're a mom, you will see that, that you know, I'd be a really terrible mom if I didn't correct you because we all need correction. I need correction. Mm -hmm. And I said, so it's just something to when everyone's calm that you can talk about that. And they usually are agreeing with me. I'm like, I would be a really terrible mom. And I do remind them, especially when they won't take a time by us as I have one child in, in particular that when I say, go take a time by yourself, or I need a time by myself, sometimes not all the time but sometimes she is persistent (laughs) and she doesn't take that cue that I'm about to snap (laughs) um and so she wants to continue to talk about it and talk about it and I know for myself that I need that time or I will say things I don't really mean or I'll give a consequence I don't really want to follow through with it'll be empty threats um all of those things will start to come out because my emotions are on the outside of my body and I'm a, and it's just not a good situation. And so I usually will tell her in those moments, I need this time by myself because I need to take a break so we can handle this right. And then when I do go back and I talk to her, I always tell her the same thing of, you know, what will, 
what kind of parent would I be? And then I remind her that I will never stop correcting you. I love you so much that I will always correct you when you're doing something wrong because I don't want to see you go down a bad road. And so just kind of reiterating that. um, And one of the things we say often in our family is that I, you know, I will never love one child more than the other because you're always going to have that child that you have to correct more than another. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way that uh, personalities are, family dynamics happen. It doesn't really necessarily matter what birth order they are, um, but it does, it's just something that you will always have to address. Yeah. So along that line, um, here's another another way to really get to know your older kids and this is this is probably one of one of the things you have to be meek and you have to be willing to be teachable even from your children and I'm Mm going to say that I'm going to preface this with that because one thing I try to ask my kids at least from the ages of nine and older when I really feel like they understand during tea time I ask them the question is there anything this past week that has not been resolved? Something that I have done, but maybe I did wrong to you or like you felt like I didn't hear you well or in a situation or I misjudged you um, or misjudged a situation. Don't be afraid to ask that because sometimes we have dealt with something wrong. And if you, even if they, even if what you said had to still stand, you're validating. Okay, I can understand why you felt that way. And either, and then if you did actually wrong, then that gives you an opportunity to resolve something that they were frustrated about mm-hmm. against you, which if you can keep the that open, it yeah. saves so much. It helps so much to be able to keep your communication lines open, but you have to be willing to say, I was wrong in that. Mm-hmm. I do tell my kids, and this is something I will always stand by as a parent, as a mom, it's easy to second guess ourselves and be like, did I take care of that situation? Right. Did I actually Mm -hmm. give the right, at least for me, I I think about this a lot. Like, Mm -hmm. did I give the right judgment to the situation or is that person actually getting chipped in this? But one thing I do tell my kids and I always try to do is be fair. So, and I've told them this, like, even if it doesn't seem fair, you can just know that I am always trying to be fair. So even if I totally like you guys bring a fight to me or a disagreement, even if I totally get it wrong, just know that no, that no, 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 that I try yeah. to be a fair mom. And that way they know like, okay, so she, she did this, she made this decision, but I do know she tried her best. Right. So just, just be teachable, even with your kids, like, mm-hmm. especially as they get older, let them tell you if you hurt them, like, and mm-hmm. sit on their bed and say, sorry, like, it's yeah. okay to say, sorry. If we, as parents, don't set the example for saying we're sorry. What kind of example are we setting for our kids? Like they're not perfect. Parents aren't perfect. And I want my kids to know that I failed. They're going to probably leave my house and be like, my mom drank too much coffee. Like I did not like that about her, (laughs) but still you're trying your best and, and just be, be a teachable meek parent, especially with your older kids. Yes. Um, I do not want to miss that point because that's something I actually wrote down to make sure that I addressed because a lot of times we just disregard like they were upset about something. We just, you know, we invalidate like, well, that was right. the decision that had to be made. So, right. And it's okay to explain more to your children, but Stephanie, you, um, you put something down here that just, I think is such a good point. And that is to, um, train your kids in the home, like yes. don't train them publicly. It's one of the reasons we don't post things on Instagram when we're trying right. to, to, you know, deal. And, and if they- you do your training at home, you shouldn't have to do your training in public. Our kid's going to make mistakes a hundred percent, just like we are. Mm -hmm. But if you are following through in the home with non-wanted behaviors, when you're out, it's just going to follow over. Um, And so that is one thing that someone told me a long time ago, do your training at home. So you don't have to do your training in public. And it makes so much sense. Now, if a, a behavior happens in public, or around somewhere else, I will never forget. So Emily was two years old and she was my easy peasy baby, easy peasy toddler. She's still my easy peasy kid. She is just the most fun loving kid and will just go with the flow. If somebody says, Hey, that's mine. She's like, okay, here you go. She just goes with everything. And she was almost three, I think. And we were at a friend's house 
and we were getting ready to leave. It was around nap time, so I had to give her a little bit of grace. It was after lunch, um, and we were getting ready to leave, and I told my girls to go help clean up. For whatever reason, she picked that moment that she did not want to clean up, and she was going to throw a massive, massive, massive fit. And I, I was caught off guard because I, she never acted like that. And I mean, to the point I had to take her carrying out kicking and screaming and buckle her into her car seat and go back in and have my other two finish cleaning up. And and she, I mean, refused. She put her feet down and she was not going to clean up and help. I don't know if it's because she didn't want to go. I don't know if she was tired. I I really honestly, to this day, don't know. She knew why. It wasn't happening. (laughs) It wasn't happening. And I, she still laughs because I have it on my phone. And so once everything calmed down, I wait I, you know I apologized to the my friend and she was like it doesn't matter you know kids are kids and I'm like I was embarrassed and all of the th- you know things anyway we had a really good talk about it after everyone was calm I think it was after nap time maybe it was in the car I can't remember but I made her do an apology video saying sorry for being selfish and it's so funny because it's still on my phone and she still watches it <laughs> um, but just telling her that she was sorry and we sent it to her in a text message and it's in moments like those, I could have dished out consequences. I could have done all these things in that moment at my friend's house when she wasn't behaving. And I think that just removing her from the situation and dealing it still at home, dealing it still in private, things are going to happen even when you're out in public and the kids still aren't going to be perfect angels because kids aren't perfect angels and none of us are, and none of us will ever be. And so I think if you can still make that mindset to do your training at home, even when something happens out in public. And if you're in public, let's hit on some older kids again. Our goal as a parent, our goals as moms is not to embarrass or humiliate our kids. Mm -hmm. And I have been present when moms have Mm -hmm. in public, like were so rude to their children. And I, I understand they were probably stressed But still, I could see on that child's face how humiliated Mm -hmm. and hurt they were. And, you know, it is really important when your child, or especially an older kid, I'm I'm speaking of ages like 10 to teenagers, um, or even six, like Mm -hmm. Selena would feel it. If you see something and there's an issue, remove them from the situation. Go to a private place get in your car, go someplace and discuss the issue fully with them because chances are maybe they were wrong. Maybe they weren't, but maybe they need correction, Mm -hmm. but you gave them the chance to, with dignity, explain to you because you are their trusted person at that point in their life. If you humiliate them, think about it. If you were with your friends or even your spouse and they chose to, to like correct you in front of people or you know, just make fun of you. Or yeah, or just, yeah. Yeah. In front of your, in front of other people, you probably wouldn't trust that person. You probably wouldn't want to hang around with them. That is your child. Mm-hmm. They're human. And you're, if you want their trust, be trustworthy. Like mm-hmm. I can't speak that enough to parents is if you want your child's trust, be trustworthy and protect them as much as you want them to protect their name and your family's name. Mm-hmm. Because if you can do that, you won't have to fake it. Like mm-hmm. you guys will have open communication And what goes along with that is you, I love how you said, you know, remove them to another room, into your car, wherever it is, because there's been times, and actually my middle has um, pointed it out to me where I'll whisper something in their ear. And later she'll be like, mom, can you not whisper to my ear? Can you like tell me later or move me aside? Because then when she goes back, people are like, what did your mom say? Why was she whispering to Mm -hmm. you? And that alone was embarrassing to her. Even though I wasn't saying it out loud, I was whispering to Mm -hmm. her in her ear yeah. Um, she, that alone was. And so, you know, being just very mindful of that in all ways. And that kind of goes with the big, with older student or students, older kids is having that open line of communication. My mom did this with my sister and I, and I've said it for, to our kids since they were young, 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 you can ask me or tell me anything. I don't care if you think you're going to get in trouble. I don't care if it's embarrassing. Mm-hmm. If somebody says something to you and you don't know what it is, um, especially as they get older, you know, things that happens or you have questions about something, you will never be, you will never embarrass me and I will never embarrass you. Ask me. I want to be the one to tell you. I want to be the one to answer those questions. 
And I've said that since they were itty, itty bitty. And my mom did. And I can remember asking my mom something very embarrassing that I had heard at in, I think it was in seventh or eighth grade on the playground. And I had at school and I had heard something, somebody had said something and I didn't know what it was. And so I, I just tucked it in the back of my mind. And I remember going home and asking my mom what that meant. And my mom with the straightest face, and I still don't know how she did it because as a mom now, I'd be like, who's not that? <laughs> she told me very bluntly exactly what it was. And we moved on. And she held to her word of saying, you can ask me anything. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to get you in trouble. And um, we have, she grew up in a home that wasn't that open. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was very important to her. And I, and I see the benefits as, because I knew without a shadow of a doubt, I didn't need to go embarrass myself to a friend and ask her what that meant. I could go to my mom mm -hmm. and my mom would tell me the truth. And that's what I want for my kids too. So keeping that line of communication open and then not acting shocked <laughs> yeah. when they ask you something that you're like, Ooh, I don't want them to know. Well, they're going to, when kids have questions, they are going to find the answer, whether it be through you or somebody else. So I would rather be the one to answer that. Question. I'll see if I can find the resource, but I remember I was listening to um, focus on the family. I think one of their episodes where somebody came on about talking about hard topics specifically having to do with um the sexual side of things with mm -hmm. your children and he recommended it and I go by it because it was such it was such a powerful thing because when people shame yes sexuality that's a problem because your children everyone we're it's all humans everyone yep. has that mm -hmm. so he made a point and I'll have to I have to see if I could find his information but he made a point to say if your child asks you something, they're probably ready for the answer. Mm -hmm. Just answer them. So like my kids can ask me anything. They have asked me, my little, little kids ask me how baby comes out. I have no problem explaining. Yeah. It's helpful if you have animals, but <laughs> yeah. I've, I've explained from myself. Ours are usually <laughs> having to do with animals. Yeah. I mean, and, but I've directly told them, you know, what God had designed, how he's designed it for me and how he's designed it, designed it for women answer the question and yeah. what nine times out of 10 they get the answer like oh okay, okay. and, they're and they move right. on but they asked me mm -hmm. if you shame it or make it sound like a taboo topic they're still going to find the answer to that will. question yeah they will go searching for it because yeah. they truly have that question yes. they want it answered and the fact that they came to you is a fantastic thing because you can be the one to answer it but if you don't answer it they're still going to find that answer and it may not be the right answer and if you're afraid as a parent to know how to talk about it. I do know there are a lot of resources out there. Mm -hmm. I did mention that one. I mean, this was a few years ago when I listened to this um, episode on Focus on the Family, but I do know Focus on the Family has a, a whole bunch of resources having to do with raising kids and stuff like that. Um, that doesn't mean I promote every little thing they say, <laughs> but that I do have a lot of respect for the, the things that they share there. So I will see if I could find that book or the episode even and see if I can link it here, but just relationship. And I wanted to also, this leads to probably our last point here, Yeah. but um, I wanted to hit on this. Cultivating relationships with your children is a decision you have to make. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you will be tired. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll get up and, and just be like, I don't even know if I have the time in my day. You have a million things going on. Yep. And sometimes there have been times where I have been so busy or I had too many things, like I had to go pick orders up different places, could we buy a lot in bulk, where I would just have to say, hey, let's just postpone this. Yeah. But I'm going to say this, time and experiences spent with your child, like no amount of gifts, no amount of money tossed at your kid will ever make up for the time that you invest in them and the experiences you enjoy with them. You have one shot at their childhood and it's gone. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a big deal to me because it's the emphasis with our relationship with children. We're all wondering like, why are they like, why are children disrespectful to us? Or why do they, mm -hmm. and it's, it goes down to relationship. Yes. And sometimes our kids are just little sinners and they're just being little sinners and you have to stand firm and you have to be the person that says, you know what? I love you with all of my heart, but I'm not going to stand for this. Well, and if we're being completely honest, Sometimes we're sinners too. Mm -hmm. And we're just little sinners. You yep. wait. I wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Yep. I am snappy. Yep. And I have 
given my kids permission to tell me in a respectful way when I'm being that way. And, and actually my middle has one time came up to me very recently and she said, mom, you're kind of snappy this morning. And she whispered it to me when I was in the kitchen and she said, I can already tell school's probably not going to go well for us. And I was like dead in my tracks. But she picked that out and she told me respectfully. And I said, you know what, Paige, you are right. And that is 100% my fault. Yeah. And I I am going to change that right and now. I think that's actually key is like, we, we, my kids and I talk about this quite a bit, like teaching your kids how to respectfully respond we to you. Should. And like, because there is a respectful way to respond to your Absolutely. parents. Um, and if they have a problem, sometimes we're in the heat of the moment. Mm-hmm. And I have told them, like, if we're in the heat of the moment, it might be best just, just to wait. And, to wait. Wait. Yes. and then we will do a yes. meeting yes. with a cup of tea and yes. we can discuss it when both of us are like mm-hmm. super settled down from it. And that, and you have to come with an appealing attitude, not right. a, hey, this was, but then I try to do the same thing to my kids. Like mm-hmm. I try to like, if you met my kids, they don't get away with a lot. Okay. <laughs> so when I say this, it's not because I'm like, oh, my kids just can do whatever they want. And they're like, no, they had, I hold them to a standard because I want them to be valuable, life-giving young adults. Right. But if I want them to do that, I also want them to learn how other adults should respond to them or when they should set up boundaries as adults, because we're literally, their entire mm-hmm. childhood, we're called to be in relationships the relationship that we, that they have with us as parents, as mm-hmm. moms, it's going to carry through to every other relationship around them. Yep. So this isn't just a, this right. is a very big topic. Well, like, and I always think too, you know, you, we're not raising children, we're raising adults. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what we're doing. Yes. I mean, that's the end result. That's the goal. And one of the things that I always think of is that our actions speak louder than our words. So if we say all the time how much they matter to us and we say all the time that they are respected and we say to them that we love them so much that this is that part of the way of not just saying it is showing them mm-hmm. that. And we show that by dropping what we're doing when they need to talk or um, telling them, I, you know, maybe you can't drop what you're doing at that moment, but telling them, I hear you, I value you at this time we have an appointment. Let's mm-hmm. talk about it then. Yeah. Letting them know that what you're saying also matches your actions. Yeah, as it's well. important. I've even had my kids like, and I might get be hitting a little bit of what we started to talk with at the beginning, but I have even had my kids, if they come up to me and I like my mind, because I have six kids, because I'm running, we're running a homestead and we're refinishing a house. I have had my kids come up to me like, Hey mom, you know, I, they'll have like a whole list of things they want to <laughs> talk about. And I know that in that moment, it's not 100% adamant that I sit and hear it, but then I'll be like, okay, so go get that notebook that I gave you and write it down. Because when we do our tea time, I want to hear, I want to hear all about it. And I want to discuss the whole thing with you. So there's times where I've had them do that. And then they'll bring their notebook and we'll discuss all the things that were on their mind. So they didn't get shut off. They know it's important if it's in their book, or if, if I have the time to stop and listen to it, it's important. Just value. You have, you were gifted with amazing souls you were gifted Mm -hmm. with children that are like I don't know there's nothing that brings more life than children yeah and you I know in one of the beginning episodes I think it's episode three mom guilt if you haven't listened to that go listen to that you were chosen to be their mom for a reason you are the best mom for them Mm -hmm. so to get it out of your head if you think oh my gosh this is too overwhelming it's not too overwhelming baby steps Yep. If all you can do is invest five to 10 minutes in sitting with them, do it. And don't, you don't even have to do it every day. Just yeah. be more intentional with the time you invest in them and care about what they care about. Mm-hmm. It it just, it makes it a huge difference. Hand. Well, and that's something, um, you know, Andrea is so good about tea time and taking her children once a week and all of that. And I've tried doing it and it, I always seem to fall off. One of the things that's worked for us, and this just gives you another perspective, is that once, a, whenever I go to town, I do my shopping on one day, I bring, I rotate and bring one of them. And it, that may be hours out together. And yep. that is our time that we get. And so if you don't feel like you have the time to do one-on-one and do something like that, yes. pick one or the other. Yep. The important thing about it is just inviting them to do things with you one on one and hear and yep. and hear what they have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, value their opinions. Value. I mean, you will always have the rule. I mean, you you make the decision, you and your spouse. Um, but 
being able to have that one-on-one time, letting them know that you do value their opinions mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. It's going to build that relationship and building a really, you know, it, it's almost like a spouse relationship, you know, your children's relationship and you should be similar to your spouse's relationship. If you guys don't show each other love and respect, you're not going to have a very solid, you're going to grow apart. That's just the way that it is in a marriage. It's kind of the same thing with kids. If you don't have love and respect to each other, you're going to grow apart. And that's when your kids become 18 and they're like, I'm out of here. Yeah. And I, I love that. It, it's, it's not about the amount. Okay. So if you love art and you love to sit down and draw, and that's something you're focused on some days, get a piece of paper and let your kids sit with you. Mm-hmm. Like it's just start small, mm-hmm. give yourself lots of grace mm-hmm. and fo- you will, I promise you, you will fall in love with falling in love with your little child that just so desperately, like children want so badly a good relationship mm-hmm. with their parents. If they don't, like I have not met one child who does not want a good relationship with their parents. So just keep that in mind. Yep. I hope this is an inspiration and encouragement to just cultivate a relationship with your child. Yep. Start very slow with with baby steps and we definitely hope this was helpful to yeah. just kind of talk about and um, kind of see what we do in our homes yep. and how that works for us. Take what you can, apply it to your family, even if it's just one thing that you picked out of this. Yep. Um, but the best thing you can do is just create that relationship. Yep. And if it doesn't work for you, well, then don't do it. Come back next episode. <laughs> back next episode. <laughs> so yes, that actually, the next episode, we are going to be talking about homesteading and butchering. So if you are a homesteader, this episode is going to be for you. We'll be talking with Ariel and Stephanie. Stephanie is a rancher's wife, as you guys know. And Ariel runs a huge 100-acre homestead farm kind of thing. Um, and I'm currently working on building one up with my husband. <laughs> so we're going to hit on homesteading and butchering. And if that's your thing, we will see Come you back next time. time. Yeah. You've been listening to the Whole Topic Podcast. To hear more, to see behind the scenes, or to get a hold of us directly, visit our socials, Facebook, and Instagram, The Whole Topic Podcast. If you'd like to hear more from Andrea, visit her blog at dearmark23.com, where she talks about whole foods, whole grains, and whole living. If you'd like to hear more from Stephanie, visit theranchershomestead.com, where she talks about simple living, gluten-free recipes, and farm life. If you'd like to see more from me, visit wildandforagecare.com, where I talk about simple living, wild recipes, and natural remedies. Thank you for listening, and God bless.